Hello, this is Mike Kappas. I'm an agent, or had been an agent, manager, and producer, executive producer of records for the last 50 years. And you're hearing me on Talking Blues. Let me begin by asking you, do you remember the moment when music connected with you or you connected with music? Yes, well, there's many musical experiences that just didn't grab me as much. But the, the moment it really got me is when I saw the Steve Miller Band with supporting act the Bonzo Dog Duda Band at the Guthrie Theater in Minneapolis in, I think, December of 1969. I grew up in northern Wisconsin, a small town, so we didn't have the opportunity to have many great artists coming through. And I finally realized I could go to Minneapolis, 90 miles away, and see a concert. And I'd been seeing high school bands playing at dances, things like that, and other bands passing through town, playing top 40 for six nights a week in a club. But seeing this concert, and I just was knocked out at how great music could be, that experience could be. And within a few months, I started promoting shows. It's interesting to me that very quickly you started to promote shows, which is basically putting on concerts, correct? Right. As opposed to what you're really known for, which is being a booking agent. Yeah. Well, having, so can you tell me where how that transpired? Well, having lost my life savings a couple of times <laughs> in a very short period of time and not much of a life savings as a college student, um, but I just, uh, well, I'll back up. Um, so after this concert that is the Steve Miller band concert, I saw, I was, had a group of friends. So there was a group of us that were kind of anti-fraternity types and we had formed our own, uh, c campus organization to be able to get the same benefits of a fraternity. And, uh, we talked about doing a concert, you know, and, and I would be the organizer and somebody else was able to bring in the money to do it. And another guy was an artist and actually had a cartoon in this in the university newspaper where he drew little teeny messages around the, the bodies and the faces that nobody would really know that there was anything unique about them. But if you look closely, it might say something negative about the university president or something like that. Very counterculture. At any rate, we uh, organized a concert with uh, one of the top progressive bands from Minneapolis, 90 miles away, and another regional band that was very popular with us. And because of this uh, university organization that we created, uh, we were able to get the university arena for $100. Actually, just to touch on that, uh, that organization, we drew names out of a glass. We all wrote our names down and drew names out of the glass out of the glass and the loser was the president. <laughs> we were very counterculture. So uh, putting on shows, what did you hope to get out of it at that point? I mean, this is really early stages, but what did it, what did you hope to get out of it? And what did it give you? Well, um, I think I made about $30 on the first concert. So that was pretty, pretty fantastic not to lose money. But uh, no, we, I had a wonderful experience, you know, and and I after that first concert, I went to Minneapolis for concerts on as often as I could afford, um, and I just wanted to share that that experience with everybody else. You know, we had a large circuit of friends, all these hippies, basically, you know, um, and just wanted to share the experience, really. And then you had asked before about uh, how how it went from promoter to otherwise. And what happened is that I, well, some people approached me hearing about this concert and, hey, can you help out this regional uh, youth center, you know, Osseo or, or wherever, you know, these tiny farm towns around, surrounding Eau Claire, which is where I lived, and uh, started doing that so I would be able to help the organization have an, something to raise funds and, you know, give to their students for their their membership while simultaneously helping friends of mine get gigs you know that were in little bands but then it went on to uh, just i got addicted to the the business of music and i was losing money a lot of the time i would travel to a 
there was a town called Abbotsford, which was they had a club that held maybe 500 people and would pack it on a weekend night. But there wasn't 500 people in the town even, you know, people came from miles around to this, somebody's having a dance, you know, so I would go to places like that and in Menominee, another 20 some miles away and talk to club owners and tell them I could bring in a band from Milwaukee or Minneapolis or something, as opposed to the local little band that was doing top 40. And so I would uh, bring those shows in, which was exciting to me to make something happen. And also it ended up giving me connection to these agencies where I was uh, buying talent from and selling it to the clubs. So, and then at one point, one of the people in our little group at college was a woman from Milwaukee. And I continued to promote shows. Uh, I ran out of money. Somebody would back me and say, I'll, I'll put up the money if you want to bring in somebody else, you know. So I brought in... Uh, Ted Nugent, of all things, who at the time was innocent enough to rocker, you know. So, as a matter of fact, he was, he was, innocent? he was, yeah, he changed. <laughs> I wouldn't uh, associate with him now, but, but at the time he came and I'd, I'd rented this movie theater, which hadn't been used for anything else for decades, but it had previously been a place where they put it on shows on stage. And so they had dressing rooms downstairs with all the lights around the mirror and everything. Half the lights were burned out and the paint was literally peeling off the walls in big sheets. And I had Ted down there and he was doing two shows and I apologized for having to do two shows and, and the state of the place. And he's like, no problem. Everything's cool. You know, whatever you want me to do. He was 100% cooperative. Um, this, and I paid him $1,000, I think. This was between his moment of journey to the center of the mind when he had a big hit and then no nothing happening and before he came back again which is something i can also tell you about i had some connection to um at any rate um so this friend of mine had come from milwaukee this woman and her boyfriend was in a band called the ox which was one of the most the top rock progressive kind of band in milwaukee so i hired them to support ted nugent and after the show, spent time at her house, her apartment, with the band hanging out and talking and everything. And uh, a week or two later, the road manager, who's also worked in the agency that booked the band, contacted me and said, would you like to come to Milwaukee and, and be, work in the agency? So I jumped at that and thinking I'd get the experience there for a few weeks and then come back and finish my last week of or last year of college. But I got so addicted to the, the booking business and the music business in Milwaukee that I, I never came back. Um, what were you going to college for? I was, this is, it's a good question, actually. I was taking, I was enthralled with psychology, which seemed to be a, reaching the masses more at that time than ever before. Like I subscribed to psychology today in the very early days and things like that. And uh, so I was taking psychology and sociology, but I was also naturally good at business. And so I took some business courses, which kind of kind of the bane of the hippie group, you know, that, you know, you don't want to be a businessman, don't trust anybody over 30, all that sort of thing. So, but I took both. So, um, cause it came, came easy to me. You know. Did you have any idea what that would lead to? I was, messing around with bands and, and partying late at night. I, I, I worked at this store, uh, ironically enough, called The Quick Trip. Um, and we were doing some trips. Um, and I worked there until midnight. And then I would close the store. And then I would start partying with my friends. And then I would go to school the next day, 8 o'clock in the morning, and miss a first class or so. So I didn't expect to become a psychiatrist or a psychologist because I wasn't getting fantastic grades, I was, I was doing okay. So I actually pictured myself as a student counselor or a resident counselor or something in a dormitory at Stout State University, 20 some miles away in Menominee, Wisconsin. That's what I figured would probably be my end point. Um, Cause having some psychology, sociology background, but using it at a very low level. I, I wonder though, if what you learned in psychology ever became very useful in your dealings with artists in later years. I think it definitely did. Um, the thing I took 
as a really basic point when I first heard about psychology is, ah, there's a reason why people are the way they are, and it all goes back to something. And so maybe gave me more understanding of people's behavior. And uh, so, yeah, in that way, I guess, yes. What would have been the first great lesson you learned? I mean, it sounds like things just happened and you thought you fell in love with the idea of promoting bands and putting on shows. But I can imagine how, that, how difficult that would be and how you could easily lose money. Was there one thing that, that hit you very quickly that made you realize, oh, I need to think about this in the future? What was the first great lesson you, you had as a promoter? Well, there are a bunch all at once, I think, actually. Um, one thing that I learned is that this small town that I lived in didn't have so many concerts like that, maybe because people weren't that interested in them, you know, and they weren't accustomed to going out and seeing music like this or paying to see music like this. But after each concert, I would kind of do a postmortem and list the things I could have done better. And I'd list about 18 things or something that I could have done better. And then the next concert, I think, well, I got 10 of them. You know, and then I realized, no, you got to get all 18 of them, you know, because you just can't can't uh, hope for the best. You've got to do everything you possibly can to make it work. But when you put on a show and you lose money, and I don't know how much you lose, but when you when you come away not making money, does that, did that ever deter you from continuing on? Well, it certainly paused it. Um, you know, like I say... Um, I would be unable to do something. One band I promoted from Minneapolis, Crow, who had a big hit at the time, regionally at least, and uh, I paid them the night of the concert. I'd fallen way short and had to go in with my father the next day to the bank to cash in a savings bond that had been set aside for my college education. <laughs> uh, wow. So, um, you know, but I still, I was enthralled with the music and I didn't foresee myself. In fact, going back to before this Steve Miller concert, I had such a small town mentality that I didn't picture myself ever doing anything special or going anywhere special. And it was only, you know, after I thought about it some more over coming months that I thought, wait, I could actually, there's no reason I can't go to Minneapolis and see concerts. I can buy a ticket and go to see a concert. And that was actually a step for me, which is, something everybody takes for granted growing up in a bigger town. But, but uh, uh, you know, so I didn't have any dreams. I never dreamed of half of the things I've ended up falling into. Well, I uh, want to follow up on that, because obviously for somebody who didn't have dreams, you've accomplished a lot. But when you got to that agency in Milwaukee and became an agent, which is seeing the other side of the business, what did that teach you? A lot. Um, well, first of all, it's, I had my toe in the other side of the business because I was working with agencies and then selling the artist to a club, you know, so I'd had a little taste of that. Um, the agency I went to in Milwaukee, like all of the Milwaukee agencies at the time, were booking local bands locally, basically. And, and they did go from Milwaukee about 200 miles north to Green Bay with stops in Oshkosh or Sheboygan or something, and about 80 miles west to, Min to Madison, but never crossed the state border to Chicago. They just had this mentality of, of where things worked. And they worked with a lot of high schools in, in the area and some colleges. Um, so I came in and I had a different mindset because I'd come from outside of that realm and I'd worked with clubs and everything. And so I expanded the the range that they were dealing with, which also meant uh, higher telephone costs. And telephone costs were pretty significant at the time. It's before competition came in. There was Bell Telephone had a monopoly. Right. And uh, so I ran, you know, in, in initial calls to clubs, you know, I've got to tell them about myself, the artists and everything else. So these were longer calls than the, the agency was used to when they were more long distance calls. And calls were charged by distance at the time, too, then. So I'd made a deal. I, I started out at zero salary and a percentage, one-third of the commission on books I, dates I booked. 
And then I got bumped up and I started doing well to $30 a week. <laughs> I can't forget if it's plus or versus the one third of the commissions that came in as a result of my bookings. And, uh, but I was making more money and costing more money than my boss appreciated. So he started changing the deal. And I said, I wasn't going for it. You know, it was, he was being very unfair and taking away the better accounts and for himself. And I said, if you, if I quit, will you pay me? Because all the payments were in the future of future bookings. We got paid when the shows played. I said, if I, I quit, will you pay me? And he said, yes. And I said, okay, I quit. And I went back to my apartment. It was in, a, in an apartment building. I was in a small basement apartment with a guitarist and this road manager. Um, the guitarist actually went on later on to work with Leonard Cohen for 20 years. But uh, at any rate, I went back and I started packing up my clothes and called my mother and said, I'm coming home. This is, I started August 1st and this is December. And uh, I was getting ready to go and one of the guys from one of the bands I was booking came in. There was a lot of band, well, there's 21 apartments, 11 of them were people the same age and several bands represented in this building. So it was really an interesting situation. But he came down and he said, what if these two bands, the Ox and the Hound Dog Band, also leave the agency and you manage us. And it's amazing to me because I'd been an agent for three months, you know, and I'd never met these guys to speak of before that. And here they're ready to leave the agency and work with me. Um, I said, well, sounds good to me. But then the bands had to vote on it. And uh, there was one holdout in one band I had to go personally and talk to. And one holdout in the other band, the trio, the ox, who was John Paris, who was just very cautious about any decisions. And we've ended up, we're still, he's one of my closest friends 50 years later, but he was a holdout <laughs> against signing on with me. But they did come around with me. And then I went to another agency in town, figuring I would manage them and I would maybe work with an agency in Illinois for that area. And another one of these local agencies that was uh, strong in the area, but not so progressive, more top 40 stuff. stuff. I went to them and talked to them about representing the band regionally. And I would have other agents for outside the region. Uh, and they said, well, we'd love to do that, but we'd love to have you as an agent too, you know? So we talked about it and I became an agent there while simultaneously managing these bands. Wow. Um, I, I wonder when you went from putting on your own shows to becoming an agent, did that change still give you the same high or the same satisfaction as a booking agent booking a band into a venue versus putting on a show for a band? Is that one and the same for you? Uh, it's it's a good question, which I never really thought of that way before. But uh, I think always being involved in a positive event where people are enjoying themselves has always been a great thing. You know, look out at the crowd and realize... This show almost didn't happen, but we did this, this, and this, and and it happened. And here's all these people having a great time. You know, that's that's always a, a high. You know, so it was just a different situation. It was not one better than the other. Uh, the the risk of being a promoter and risking so much money at the time, all of your money, um, in my case, because I didn't have much, um, versus the safety and security of not having a risk except your own living costs. Uh, was, you know, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I never looked back at wishing I was a promoter ever again. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder, so I'm always curious about the role of the manager versus the agent. And at a very high level, I presume the agent's the one who gets your gigs and the manager is the one that helps manage the band's career, which, yeah. which could be so many different things. But can you maybe at a high level explain to me the difference between the yeah, two? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. It's a really important one for people that are not familiar. Um, the agent has got a very defined uh, role of securing the live performances. And in some cases, securing television, which most of the time they didn't, but I, I did more of because I had good I had developed good relationships with uh, Letterman Show and people like that. Um, Letterman dating myself right there at the late show, which is now, uh, whoever, <laughs> anyway. Um, and, uh, in some cases, 
more so in recent years, agents have been more involved in helping get other opportunities for artists. But for the most part, it's the live performances. And the manager is responsible for everything else. So um, when, when you say the live performances, are we talking con- like getting the gig and dealing with the contracts or is it just getting with the gigs? No, it's, it's one and the same. It's uh, you, the agent uh, has a discussion with the manager or the band leader. And if there's no manager as to their wants and needs, and then the agent should be out there following up on the goals of the artist. Is it a tour? Is it just X number? Is it only weekends or is it a, a cohesive tour for three weeks or three months or whatever? And you go out and you pursue the right opportunities for the artist and those that are within the artist's reach. You want to have a situation where the drives between gigs is not un- unmanageable. You want to have the right venue the right, you don't want to put an acoustic artist into a venue that's used to hard rock and people don't tend to listen to quiet down for an acoustic artist. You want to make sure if they're on the bill with another act that it's a compatible thing, that if they're opening for somebody, that the audience of the headliner is going to be appreciative or receptive to the to your artist as the opening act. Otherwise, I mean, some that's a place where a lot of people made mistakes is they think, we can get on tour with this biggest act in the world. You know, this is a key to success. And I knew it happened with the Blasters opening for Queen. The Blasters was rockabilly and very popular at a certain time. And it was the worst experience of their lives, I think. You know, people didn't bother to come in and sit down, most of them, until the headliner was on. So they're playing to majority empty seats. And those people didn't really give them much of a response. And so you take all these factors into consideration and what is going to work best for the artist, period. I do want to ask about that, because in the late 60s, early 70s, you saw lineups that were quite versatile, where they would have like a a heavy metal, not heavy metal, but hard rock band with a jazz band with Indian music or whatever. I mean, that seemed to be some of the things that you would see at at the Fillmore. Did that, was that because of the time? I mean, did that change? Because it seemed like people would see these lineups, which were so crazy but people seem to be into it but did people's musical taste change that they wanted something that was more um compatible with one another well i know the kind of lineups you're talking about and they were really unique i think michael bloomfield actually had a lot to do with that that uh, bill graham uh consulted him on things and michael had a really great i booked him as a matter of fact the first fresh artist I signed at Rosebud was Michael Bloomfield. Um, but he had an encyclopedic knowledge of music. And so he would come up with a lot of these things, I think. And this is also, when you're talking about the prime days of the film or late 60s, early 70s, especially in San Francisco, you had a, a, a lot of hippie audience, you know, and they were open to different things and they're much more open. And later on, I think people got into boxes a lot more. And, you know, a jazz artist may not may not fly in front of a very hard rock artist in, in the rest right. of the country at a later time. So before I interrupted you, you were, you were talking about the role of the agent. Now, can you talk about the role of the manager? Yes. The manager is a fairly fluid role, but in general, you are responsible for, you're the funnel of information from the artist to the rest of the world that they deal with and from the rest of the world that they deal with back to the artist. Um, so that manager might be working with an, an attorney, their their legal representation, a merchandise company, a record company, especially a publishing company. They may arrange for the, well, they would arrange for transportation, flights, buses, etc. So it's a really extensive role and there, therefore, you see managers with much shorter rosters usually than agencies. An agency can just focus on getting the gigs. Manager, and the manager role varies uh, to whatever the two parties agree to, which is the nature of most contracts. Contract is whatever two parties agree to. And in the case of an Eric Clapton or a Bonnie Raitt or the Rolling Stones, no manager is going to come and guide them as to how their next record should go. 
um, and what they should be doing. But so that's one extreme. And, and the, the, those artists really know what they want and they know what they're doing. They've got a ton of experience. And the other end of the spectrum is maybe not so popular anymore, but well, in a way it is in the K-pop world, but uh, individuals, entrepreneurs who would put together a boy band and they might seek out and audition individuals uh, to see who's going to be in that band. And then they might have a choreographer and they bring in songwriters to, to get the right songs and they have somebody dress them a certain way. And that's all coming out of the manager controlling everything, you know, where on, so on one extreme, you've got the manager controlling everything. On the other hand, you've got the manager doing the right thing by keeping their nose out of the artist's music and everything. And uh, in between is anything the two parties agree to. So when the, when these bands came to you and said, Hey, could you manage us? What did you know about managing at that point? That's, that's a really good question because the answer would be nothing, I think, <laughs> <laughs> except what I had absorbed by osmosis by working with people. But so many of the artists that I worked with in Milwaukee did not have managers even. So, um, yeah, I was, I was not a great manager in the beginning. Not only with those guys, I never got them a record deal. And actually, I was talking with a friend of mine, John Paris, again, I think, actually about this recently. And uh, he was lamenting the fact that so many of the artists in that, that metropolis, that little metropolis, did not have record deals. Um, we were just, we were so small time. A friend of ours worked as a college representative for Columbia Records, that later to become Sony, in Madison, Wisconsin, at the university there. And he was the only person we knew connected to the record business. And, and at that time, it's like, maybe we can get a record deal. We can talk to so-and-so. It's not his realm at all. You know, we just grasping at straws for connection. And uh, even later on, I took on management for John Hyatt. And he was on Epic Records, already had recorded on Epic Records when I met him and, and brought him into a club that I was booking in Milwaukee. And I was... I was the only person really getting behind him. And uh, so he said, well, I was going to ask you to be a manager as soon as I started making more money. And I said, why wait? You know, so, and it turned out I was, that's a, this leads into another point I always make about what's a good manager. But uh, I wasn't at the time, actually. I did not have the context. I had all total dedication to the artist. I thought he was amazing, and I did some good things for him. I got him established on a low level around the country in clubs and everything and in colleges, but I didn't have really good record label contacts. I wasn't, I didn't have any friends at record companies. and uh, But just based on somehow a promotional package that I put together, which was a big deal at the time, we had no internet, of course, but Promotional packages and sound systems were selling points for a band, you know. Oh, they've got this great sound system. And we would, the bands would bring their own little sound systems instead of having it. It wasn't usually in these clubs. And the other thing was great promotional materials and great posters. That would be a selling point for a band to get a gig because it was a tool that the promoters could use to get more people in. And this uh, somebody at Geffen Record, or not Geffen, it was e &M, um, had seen this thing I'd put together for John, and that was that spurred their interest, and they flew us down to L.A., and, and John uh, auditioned for, I'm blanking on his name now, but he was the producer of some of the early Springsteen records, and uh, we didn't get a deal, but uh, at any rate, I was not a great manager. I was all dedication and no connections. I want to get back to that because obviously you yeah. became a, a decent manager later on. And I presume time got you more connections and that gave you more opportunities. Yeah. Um, at one point or another, you decided to move to San Francisco to join another agency. Yeah. And the agency went bankrupt or fell apart within the first few months. Yeah. What did you learn from that experience? And sorry, did you go to San Francisco because you thought it was a bigger market? It was a bigger, better opportunity for you? Well, at this point in Milwaukee, like I'd been there about five years and I was bringing in a lot of the national talent into this club that I was booking in, a, in addition to being an agent for all these artists. And I ran the bookings through, I wasn't, a, it wasn't a secret side thing. I ran all the bookings through the agency and 
got my share of the commission on everything I did. But I had been going to New York regularly, a band that I was working closely with had gone to New York to try to make it. And uh, I was actually paying their rent in a loft there for some time, $1,000 at the time, which unapproachable now. But, uh, and I was making better connections. I was actually, I actually connected with Clive Davis and I had his home phone number and I got him out to see this band and everything. And uh, various other connections little by little. And I was feeling like going somewhere, somewhere more significant. New York, LA, Boston, San Francisco, one of those. And uh, I actually had been buying a lot of talent from this one New York agency. And like I said, bringing in a lot of the name talent into the, into the town at a couple different clubs, then several, and uh, doing a lot of business with one agency. I met with them in New York and I said, you know, I could be interested in working here too. And the guy didn't even lift his head off his, his what he was looking at on his desk. And I thought, I guess I got some more work to do. <laughs> I'm not, I was a big fish in a little pond. I didn't have to pay to get into any clubs because I worked with so many and they'd get free drinks and, and come and go as I pleased and do a lot of business with them. But that was not a big deal in New York. You know, so, so I figured I got to work harder and I, and I bore down much more. But at any rate, I had this interest in going somewhere bigger. I'd been to a billboard conference, which preceded pole star conferences, bringing the industry together. And in Los Angeles, I think it was maybe the second one I'd gone to, I ran into a person and became friends with this woman. And, and we thought, how about going to San Francisco? I'd been to LA a number of times before that also, having won trips there, selling newspaper subscriptions actually. Um, and, uh, I never was that in, endeared with LA. I never had that feeling flying out that, oh, I wish I'd have spent more time here or anything, but I'd heard good things about San Francisco, went to San Francisco and fell in love with it for its lack of pretensions, which I think LA is full of. And, uh, I just thought I would work for peanuts to live in, to work in the city or live in the city. So. Later on, uh, I was booking Eddie Harris. What I'd done in booking this club called Teddy's in Milwaukee, brought in a lot of jazz artists, a lot of blues artists, Muddy Waters, Howlin' Wolf, Freddie King, on and on, and Mose Allison, John Hammond, John Lee Hooker, who all three of those and Muddy Waters became clients later on. Um, and some of them from the coast would say, I'd contact them about coming in there, and they'd say, well, sounds good, but you know, going all the way to Milwaukee for three nights or whatever is it's going to eat up my expenses you know, my income, you know? So I developed a circuit around the Midwest of other places that could, could appreciate the same type of artists in Madison and my hometown, Minneapolis, Iowa city, Chicago, things like that. So, and one of those artists that I did that with one was Mose Allison and a John Lee hooker, but also Eddie Harris. And, Eddie Harris grew to trusting me with all of his bookings except the West Coast, where he was working with this offshoot of a jazz club, Keystone Corner Jazz Club in San Francisco, which had started their own agency, Keystone Music Agency. So, and I let Eddie know I was interested in moving on to a bigger metropolitan scene. And he talked to those guys and they were interested in hiring me. And uh, I, San Francisco, my dream, you know, so I talked to this guy for about 45 minutes on the phone and realized afterwards I didn't get anything, any clear answers on anything, but I missed those signposts and I was just excited to go to San Francisco and work. And so I asked for and got my same deal that I'd had when I worked for somebody here is $30 a week and uh, versus uh, my commissions, you know, a third of my commissions that I brought in. So I moved to San Francisco to join this agency and it was totally disorganized. Didn't pay me ever. You know, I started May 10th, I think. And at the beginning of August, I came into the office one day and the phones were cut off because he hadn't paid the phone bill either. So I went home and just, I called Eddie Harris and he said he'd stick with me. I called John Hyatt, who I'd been managing even before 
I moved to San Francisco and he said he'd stick with me, whatever I did. And I called Michael Bloomfield and we talked about 45 minutes and he said, you're the most logical agent I ever talked to. I'll do everything with you. Wow. So I signed him on day one. And uh, also Anthony Braxton, who had, I'd been doing bookings for through this agency. I'd never seen Anthony before, but I'd been doing bookings for him. It turns out, here's 50 years later almost, I still have never seen Anthony Braxton. I've never met Anthony Braxton. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I've booked shows for him. I'll, sh I'll end this story in a minute. I'll just tell this one more anecdote. Um, at the time, jazz clubs were booking five and six nights a week, and there was a lot more of them around the country. Most every major city had a good jazz club. And I booked Anthony in Baker's Keyboard Lounge in Detroit for five or six nights. Six nights, I guess. And the Monday was off. And then I had him booked the next five or six night run at Jilly's in Dayton, Ohio, which brought in a lot of jazz artists. The Monday is open. The Agora in Cleveland, Ohio, was doing special Monday night shows with more national artists. Anthony had told me his price was $3,000 or $3,500, regardless of the number of nights, um, five nights, six nights. So I got him that in date in Detroit and in Dayton. On the Monday night, I, which was right geographically right in between, I got him a $1,000 gig. And he said, I told you. My price is three thousand dollars. <laughs> so he passed out. He's getting about five hundred dollars a night. The other nights, this is right on the way on a Monday night. So it was just an example of uh, us not being on the same wavelength, and it didn't last a lot longer than that. He was also frustrated by the fact that Les McCann and Eddie Harris were getting great gigs and lots of gigs, and and look at the reviews that Anthony was getting, and why isn't he getting the same thing? Well, he wasn't commercially viable as much as they were not as known to the general population as they were but people i don't know if you know anthony braxton his i don't know i'll just get in a second his song titles on his albums were geometric equations there was no english word in any of his song titles um so he's very unique very out there here's a guy who really didn't have big dreams and now you're in San Francisco with the opportunity to join another agency that falls apart and you s decide that you're going to start your own agency which is a pretty big move I, I don't know if it was a desperate move or if it was like now I have goals um, well I can back up to Rosebud actually I'd, uh, I'd been driving around with a girlfriend in Milwaukee and thinking about the responsibilities I had at the time, which were a tiny fraction of what it later became, and thought about the movie Citizen Kane and how at the end of the movie, Charles Foster Kane looked back to his sled when he was a kid sliding down the hill. And I thought, Rosebud, I'm here dreaming about my earliest days hiking around a lake where we lived and everything. And should I go fishing or hunt turtles or whatever? And I thought, if I ever have an agency, I'll call it Rosebud. Anyway, so back to this agency goes out of business. I go home. I'd moved to California with records and a turntable and, and a sleeping bag, I think, or something. I had a little Porsche 914, two seats in a little trunk, and that's all I could fit. And uh, I bought a bed from the previous tenant in the apartment I found uh, for $35. And uh, so when I came back from the phones being cut off at Keystone, I would sit on the bed and, and it was absurd. Here I am in San Francisco. I'd never booked a date at that point west of Nebraska or something, you know, and here I am starting an agency and I'd had a friend who started an agency just before that. And I thought, you got to be crazy to start an agency now. This was during an oil shortage and you could only get gas every other day and all disco was killing live music all over the place. But here I am just desperate. So I kind of got an idea of what was going on regionally with other agencies. I think I talked to one or two, but there was nothing that really felt right to me. And then I had friends in Los Angeles. Some of my friends from Milwaukee had moved to Los Angeles. I went down there and said, hey, how about we get together with so-and-so, another friend? And they said, well, we could, but it's like 45 minutes that way on the freeway. Oh, what about so-and-so? Well, it's like 45 minutes the other way on the freeway. And I thought, I don't want to be here. You know, it's, I'll spend my life breathing carbon monoxide on a freeway. Um, so I just, and it was kind of desperation. It was just like, 
I got it. I had no money to speak of. And so I just uh, had to make do and back to the $35 bed. I went downtown. I bought a typewriter, bought paper. At that time, we had no computers. We had carbon paper. You'd make four copies of contract by using three pieces of carbon paper in between the regular paper. And uh, I bought a stapler, a couple of things like that, you know, and I came back and would sit on the bed during the day calling talent buyers. And luckily there was a few clubs in Milwaukee I was still working with as well as one stage at Summerfest. And uh, I would call the buyers and then at night I'd pull a closet shelf or shelf out of the closet, put it on the bed, put the typewriter on the shelf and type the contracts and other letters and to send promotional material and everything. So um, pretty raw beginnings. How do you look back on those times? Uh, kind of, wow. <laughs> um, making no money. I also, and, but I was getting deposits for gigs and they'd go into the bank account. And then it, the nature of the booking is that you try to get 50% of the money in advance to guarantee that the promoter is invested in the show and not going to cancel on you. And then after the show plays, you take out your 10% booking commission and send the rest on to the artists. Well, the, uh, IRS saw me reporting an income for the year of like $1,500 and, uh, but hundred thousand and something going in and out of my bank account. So they said, they actually accused me of lying. These people, they said, so you, you take, you give some of the artists and then you pocket, whatever, you know, they just, it's hmm. pretty outrageous. And they, they didn't finalize everything. I showed them everything and they said, we'll be back, you know, never, heard from them again until the next audit of a year or two later same situation empty out all my receipts prove everything and they say we don't trust you still we'll be back you know leave me worrying about when they're gonna do what to me and they never contacted me again you know it's very very strange but uh so there were weird days you know and i was i had no money i had had to actually save like three thousand dollars before i left uh left milwaukee so that survived me for a while on three packages of Kraft macaroni and cheese for 99 cents was a staple, you know, and things like that. Somebody ran into the back of my car and I couldn't open the trunk. Uh, if I had a flat, I wouldn't be able to get to it. And I got $350 for a settlement from the insurance company and I had to use it for food, you know. Uh, so luckily I didn't get a flat tire because uh, I couldn't have opened the trunk. It was Crazy times. Survival. I presume having Mike Bloomfield as one of your first clients, I mean, I don't know if he gets the respect that he deserves. I think there's a lot of musicians who put him on a pedestal. I don't know how successful he was as somebody that you represented, but that must have helped to have a name act like that on your roster. He was a good name act. And I also established, after, I mean, I'd been doing this thing not 100% exclusively with Mose Allison and John Lee Hooker prior to Rosebud. So I reconnected with them too and and grew into exclusive representation for John Lee and actually never did with Mose, but we were, worked together and were friends till the end. But Michael uh, was a good name for me. The bottom line in New York was kind of like the ultimate club in North America, really, um, where Bruce Springsteen chose to do his shows when he was on the cover of News Newsweek and Time Magazine and kicked off his really kicked his career in high gear out of that and bottom line had kind of disregarded what i had to offer before and all of a sudden they were listening to me and and they were i loved working with them actually and but anyway michael the reason he was available to me one reason was because i don't think a lot of other people really wanted to work with him on an exclusive basis he developed a, a poor reputation for uh canceling gigs and everything and I told him, as I did with most anybody, that I don't mind if you take one gig in the year or 300 gigs in the year, as long as once you make the commitment, you stick with it. And I talked to Michael about that. We were on, on board and going, had a nice relationship. He had a drug problem. And he, at one point he said, I'm in a halfway house now. He called me up and told me the new number he's at because he's in a halfway house. And I said, well, what do we do about it? He said, no, I can get out for gigs. It's okay. <laughs> you know, so, um, and then I would deliver gigs mainly regionally, some further out, but he, he was reluctant to commit to much uh, as far as extensive touring. But I had a bunch of offers in the Northeast for him, including Toronto. 
and uh, in New York and a few others. And he accepted them all. It's like eight or nine gigs or something. And I said, are you sure? Because this is so out of character for him. He said, no, 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 I want to do it. So I booked the gigs and then it got closer to the time of the gigs playing. And he told me he had to cancel them all. He just wasn't going to go. He had, he was nervous. He had uh, insomnia and uh, it really affected him heavily. And he was, had, you know, super session was supposed to be Mike on both sides of the record. It was only one because he left in the middle, you know, um, just not dependable at any rate. So I said, well, you know, our deal. And so I stopped booking him just about a year ago in a book on Michael Bloomfield. I read that I was the cruel guy who sent him on tour in the Northeast in the middle of the winter. And what the hell was I thinking? What kind of an asshole was I? And I contacted the writer and I said, I didn't do that. I booked it first in November and he canceled on me. And apparently they rebooked it. Somebody else rebooked it after me. And so the guy wrote an apology on his, his Facebook page or something. But, but at any rate, uh, one of many things in books that are not correct. Can you tell me how you viewed the blues back then? I, I know you're not exclusively blues and you've worked with so many different types of artists, but there's definitely a, a, a large blues impact in, in what you've done. So when you first started, tell me about your perception of the blues back then and, and how, it, how it grew or changed as you established your company. Well, it's another very good question, and I appreciate you saying not exclusively blues, because I never wanted to be stereotyped just blues. I loved Los Lobos. I loved the Blind Boys of Alabama, Mavis Staples, all sorts of others, you know, uh, John Hyatt, James D. Stanley, all sorts of people. Anyway, uh, I was hearing and loving the blues and not knowing it via Cream, via Jeff Beck doing Ain't Superstitious by Willie Dixon, Cream doing Spoonful by Willie Dixon. I later on represented Willie Dixon, um, but I didn't realize this is blues. And even Led Zeppelin, a whole lot of love was actually stolen from a Willie Dixon song, You Need Love. And uh, so I was loving it, but not realizing it. And I saw this one band, again, recommended by my friend Mary Ketting, who was the, the link to Milwaukee, um, told me this Milwaukee band was coming to our town and playing in one of these clubs, short stuff. And they were not a pure blues band, but they're much closer to a blues R&B kind of thing. And they played one set. Well, they played a number of sets, but after the first set, I came up to the keyboard player and I said, really effing great, except they didn't say effing. <laughs> and uh, I was just blown away, really. And as a matter of fact, about three days ago, I called that same guy to see how he's doing. He's 85 years old now, and we had a really wonderful talk, you know. But um, but they were the start. I credited him with my love of the blues, you know, him and that band. Uh, and they were a great band. I presume there was, I think we talked about this a little bit last time we spoke to one another, about blues and the representation that, the lack of representation it had. Um, and then, you know, obviously... B.B. King got representation. You know, what you did with John Lee Hooker is huge, um, but it, it, there's a limited number of people who, who got that kind of recognition. Why do you think that is? Well, I think there was very little money to be had in the blues at the time. Um, you hear about a significant sh Chicago blues artists that we recognize as significant now, but in Chicago, they were playing for maybe a, the door at a 150 seat club in South side of Chicago or something, you know, and then like muddy waters and going to England and being treated like a King or various others going with the American folk and blues festival tours, which Willie Dixon helped Lipman and Rao in Germany put together and, and give them the best people, you know, steer them to the right people and put it together. Um, but other than that, you know, the local scene, was really poor. And uh, there were certain things like Ann Arbor Blues Festival or something that had been a wonderful gig for those guys. But the rest of the year, outside of some festivals, they were not in good shape at all. And, and because they weren't bringing in much money, it wasn't appealing to managers or agents to spend their time on, on these guys. I moved to Milwaukee just a few months after seeing this band Short Stuff. And the agency I joined, which had the Ox and the Hound Dog Band, who later came with me, also booked short stuff. 
So here I was a couple months after being knocked out by these guys representing them. I'm not sure what happened first, but Corky Siegel, the Siegel Schwab Band, was in Chicago. So I guess maybe, maybe did something with them. And somehow Bruce Iglauer called me up wanting me to book Hound Dog Taylor, which was his only release so far on Alligator Records. He'd just started. I didn't know how he, he got to me at my home phone number, which I don't know how he got that, but um, somehow word spread. There's this guy in Milwaukee who doesn't rip you off and only charges 10%, and they were probably getting ripped off on commissions as well as who knows what else in Chicago. There was a cancellation of a show in Beloit College in Beloit, Wisconsin, just across the border from Illinois. And I was in touch with that that person at the school that booked shows. And I came up with uh, Sam Lay, I'd somehow gotten to know. And I contacted Sam Lay about could he bring a band in on that night. And he said yes, it was maybe a thousand dollars or something. And then he said, we hang up, I make the deal. And then he calls back and he says, I could get Lucille Span, Otis Span's wife, in there too for another hundred and fifty dollars. I could get Chicago Slim for another hundred and fifty dollars. We were one at a time, and it ended up being like four other special guests, and uh, that ended up helping spread the word. I think a little too about you know opportunities that I was involved in that were helpful for and and paid okay, and you didn't have to get ripped off by the agent, and so a lot of it came to me, and then I when I started booking this club in Milwaukee, it was mainly blues and jazz was the, the focus. So I ended up uh, developed a good reputation. There was nobody with a good reputation. It's not that I was superhuman. I was doing what any, anybody should be. It's just that everybody else wasn't, you know, in that realm. So, But knowing the realities of the blues artists and the marketability, were you hesitant with working with John Lee Hooker? Like, how did that relationship start? <laughs> I can't remember. But I think I did tell you this, but yeah, it was crazy. It was a very crazy start to have the history that ended up unfolding after that. I had booked John Lee just like anybody else in this club through this agency in New York that listed everybody you could think of in blues and R&B with no exclusive relationships with anybody, I think, but they would have their phone numbers and and they'd list them, and a number of agencies did this at the time because uh, there was other talent buyers that didn't have contacts and you didn't have directories available to you. So I contacted that agency. I booked Johnny Hooker for a few days, like a Thursday, Friday, Saturday or something in Milwaukee at this club. And as I typically did a few days in advance, I would call the agency or the manager of the artist and say, do you need a pickup at the airport or whatever, you know, and are you all set on your hotel? So I called the agency and they said, we don't know, you know, here's his phone number. You can call him and which was pretty bizarre, but there was no tight relationship there. So I called John Lee and he said, Milwaukee, I'm not coming to Milwaukee. I just came back from the dentist. I had all this heavy work done. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> this is on like two day notice. So that's how our relationship started out with him <laughs> canceling me on about a two day notice. But I did rebook him. And then it, like several other artists, I ended up and maybe more so with him than most anybody besides Eddie Harris and Mose Allison building out this territory that I could get dates for him in. It ended up being everything east of Colorado after given a couple of years of building it out. Knowing that the blues had a limited marketability, was were you hesitant to take on somebody like John John Lee Hooker or why would you have have spent that or spent that time or made that connection? Well, for one thing, and hopefully it wouldn't be the determining factor. I wasn't such a big shot that I could look down my nose at somebody making $1,000 a night or something. Um, actually, the regional bands I was booking, high end was maybe $500 a night for some of those people, um, maybe 1000 on occasion. So uh, it was plus, you know, he was a name artist who uh, was special to me. And all of these people, like, I don't, I was just thinking about it the other day. I, I, I fell in and I just got busy doing everything. I was working with artists before I'd ever heard their music on record in a lot of cases. I don't think I had a Muddy Waters record until after I was his representative. You know, and maybe the same with John Lee Hooker. Um, yeah, definitely the same as John Lee Hooker, actually. I just wasn't one of those kids who grew up with their friends sitting around and playing records for each other, where I was, none of us knew about the blues at all. So when I started 
booking shows for these people, suddenly I'm hearing about people and, and booking them because they needed representation. And will you book me here or there, whatever? I was booking them before I knew their background, but I knew their name value and everything, you know. So um, so I wasn't reluctant to book with John Lee, although I did learn quickly that he had a bad reputation also for not always showing up, not always honoring contracts. The bottom line again, I went to the bottom line and talked to them about John Lee Hooker, who I was much more ingrained with at the time. They said we wouldn't book him because he we'd booked him before and he didn't show up, you know, and and he's not reliable. So as part of my building a relationship with John Lee, it was a couple, several instances where he canceled on me. And unlike Bloomfield, I, where it was a full tour in the Northeast, uh, it was individual gigs that John Lee just, he's one of one place he canceled like three times in a row. I'd rebook and he'd cancel again, you know. And uh, I just, I th threatened to quit at a point. And his manager at the time was equally unconcerned with the sacred nest of a contract and uh, i said i gotta go you know and he said wait a second you know and he he called the manager fired the manager and said i'll go with you you know and then he behaved much better about honoring contracts after that but he came up in a whole different world and and there was other instances with him later on where he was not so great on honoring an agreement or a contract but the positive sides were wonderful you know we became friends we would talk on average, at least once a day. There might be days that went without it, but there's days that were multiple calls. And uh, you want to jump into the healer? Uh, yeah, let's let's do that. Okay, so um, I'm John Lee's booking agent. He asked me to be his manager, but I wasn't that thrilled with the makeup of his band at the time. Wouldn't have been honored to be their manager. And then I never stepped into any situation of uh, telling an artist they got a hire this person or fire this person or anything. That was their world. So I just passed on managing. And uh, then Van Morrison had called John Lee at a point and they had collaborated actually 20 some years earlier when John Lee lived in England for a while and wanted to do something with John Lee. And John called me about it and started talking about it. I could tell he was unsure what to do. And I said, do you want me to talk to him? And he said, yeah, please, you know, so, so I talked to Van and we met at one of his gigs and talked and, and he wanted to just maybe produce John Lee. And, and then I said something about, we have to look at the business side and, and uh, it kind of freaked him out. He really didn't like to deal with business and it kind of went away and nothing further happened at that point. But then later on, uh, John Lee was playing this small club north of San Francisco in Sweetwater in Mill Valley. And he really liked the club as many artists did. And they all also really liked the owner, Jeannie Patterson. And uh, so John Lee would play there more often than bigger venues that he could sell. And uh, Carlos Santana would called me up and said, can I, I see John Lee's playing in Mill Valley. Can I come down and sit in? I'll bring my own amp and everything. It won't be a bother. And uh, it's okay. Choose my arm, you know, so, um, <laughs> So that happened many times. They actually consistently sat in with John and became friends with John, which they hadn't really known each other before. And uh, George Thorogood, who I represented at the time, uh, was a huge fan of John Lee Hooker's, and he sat down and met with him and talked to him when he was in California before he was taking off anywhere. Just a huge fan. And he called me up. With Carlos called me first and s said, if John Lee makes another record up, I want to be a part of it. And I wasn't his manager and I wasn't making his records at the time, but I made note of it. George Thurgood called separately, not too long afterwards, with almost the same script. If John Lee makes another record, I want to really want to be part of it. And was John Lee doing much recording at that point? No, he'd, he'd basically given up. His last record before that, I think, was The Cream on Tomato Records, and it was recorded live at, south of San Francisco and went nowhere, which most of his records in the later years before the healer did, because you could uh, buy the new Johnny Hooker record for $15, or you could go into a Johnny Hooker record bin with 60 records in it. And several are the greatest hits or the golden, golden hits of Johnny Hooker or something. You don't get them all for nine ninety nine, 
We'll buy the new one that nobody's talking about for $15. So his new records were doing nothing. So Johnny had basically given up on recording. But I had this idea of, uh, I'd also been approached by letters sent to me by fans saying, Johnny is, you know, it seems like he's been controlled by producers to try to chase the latest trend of kabuki wuki of a disco-y kind of thing, or another one that was more towards psychedelic and so on. And why doesn't he do something like the old days, more acoustic? So I had this, in, I just had this idea of, I know Van Morrison, Carlos Santana, George Thurgood want to do something with John Lee. There's another whole story about Robert Cray being indebted to John Lee uh, for helping him in the beginning. I knew he would want to do something. I'd been around John Lee when he was with, on the same bill with Bonnie Raitt, and they were flirting and having fun and just loving each other. And uh, I knew she would probably join in. Los Lobos had told me how much they loved playing with John Lee. Charlie Musselwhite was a close friend of John Lee's. I thought, put together a record that, not thinking big bucks or, you know, music business, but thinking of it as an audio scrapbook. That John Lee, who was really proud didn't, to be acknowledged and friends with people like Carlos and Bonnie, he was a, a groupie like anybody else. And for him to be able to say, this is me with Bonnie Raitt, this is me with Carlos and Jen, and Carlos and Bonnie feeling the same way, you know, I got to do this record with John Lee. So I thought of it as an audio scrapbook. But as it came together, the recordings were really good quality, I think. And I felt like this deserves a better push. You know, this deserves not just a small blues label, but somebody that can get it out to the world. And uh, so I went about trying to sell it to record labels, most of whom, almost all of whom turned up their nose and thought, Johnny's selling nothing. They were looking at the past sales, not the future potential and not feeling that there would be potential even with these guest artists and so i got turned down by most everybody including you two who had their own label at the time and i offered them the world outside north america for twenty five thousand dollars advance and they passed he ended up selling a million records on that very same record they listened to outside of north america well how did you feel personally when when everybody was passing on this i thought Come on, guys, get serious. You know, look at the re look at the potential. The past is the past, and those were all different types of situations. But they were just writing John Lee off as somebody who couldn't couldn't sell. So I had a a friend who I'd worked with when he booked a small folk club or had a had a small label actually in in Rockford, Illinois, which is only about ninety miles from Milwaukee. But we had a a loose but positive relationship. And he had gone on to become a head of a Chameleon Records uh, in Los Angeles, a small label backed by a very wealthy family. Um, and I contacted him and he talked to his people and, and they passed. And I was looking for $50,000, you know, uh, or I was down to that point. I Initially, my lawyer was thinking it should be 400000 but nobody's going for that. So they passed, and then I continued to try to sell it. And then they came back to me, Chameleon Records, and they, they had, that family had just bought the VJ catalog. And they thought maybe releasing the healer in conjunction with uh, telling the world about the VJ catalog they just absorbed would be a good uh, uh, synchronistic advantage for them. So the healer really is a press release kind of for their other project. Hmm. So at any rate, they were there and they had, I think at the time, capital distribution. It was went from one to the other between Capital and Warners. Um, and this is before I think Capital was absorbed by EMI, but it was major distribution. So I thought, okay, we got, which frequently one of my favorite things, a small company that cares about you and a larger company under the umbrella of a larger company that can do the things that a large company can do. So we signed with them. And uh, I have to hand it to them. They did step forward with a video with Carlos Santana, which was filmed in the back room of their, their warehouse and just the two of them mimicking their, their performances. And uh, later on with Bonnie Raitt and then later on with Robert Cray as well. But in the meantime, billboard charts were determined by reports they received on a weekly basis from retailers, either a, could be an individual mom and pop store 
in Peoria, Illinois, that was weighted, and they had different weights as to multiples of whatever to to combine all the numbers to make the chart. And so they would have a small mom and pop store, but they'd also have Tower Records on Sunset in LA, Tower Records in San Francisco, all the New York, all the different things, sources, about 160 different sources whose numbers were combined and, and factored to make the logo charts. So we took it upon it. I had hired a guy who had come out of retail, uh, Steve Lee, and he, uh, he would call all of these people every week. And we'd say, do you have the hooker record? No, we don't have it even. And we'd contact the record label and say, get the records out to this store, you know, reach this store, they're a billboard reporter. And then they would say, we got the record, but we'd like to have an in-store play copy, a free copy that we can play in the store, interest people in the record. So we'd call the record company again, can you get in-store play records to this, these different record stores? And do you have any posters? And yes, we did, but these people didn't have them. So we'd tell the record company, can you get the posters to these places, you know? And then all of a sudden, uh, they're saying, we can't, we ran out of the record. We can't get the record. And we, I contacted the label. I said, what's going on? These people are saying they can't get the record. And they said, well, we, uh, you know, recouped our $50,000 advance and we didn't want to pay for more records and have them sit in the warehouse and not sell. So we just stopped. You know, and I said, hello, wow. you know, you, we're getting great airplane VH1, which was more experimental, more open and adventurous at the time and uh, getting great press and everything. And I said, if they don't sell next month, they'll sell the month after. Come on, guys, you know, and they pressed up more. And about six months later, we were, they had stopped at 50,000. About six months later, we were at 500,000. You know, because they got the record out, they had the publicity, they had the tools needed in the in the stores, and we were getting very. It was John Lee's story. It was a very good story at the time. You know, how did he feel about that album? You know, and when I came to him with the idea originally, he was like, eh, "I don't even want to. I'm giving up on recording." He wasn't, and then he ended up being very, very proud of it. You know, um, when it came together and, and the collaboration with these artists, and then making videos with a few of them. It was, and once again, he was in, he was impressed by the people he was working with and, and really appreciating it. But also, you know, it was a big financial stimulus for him and uh, huge. It actually increased the value of all of his other records and his publishing and everything. Um, so he was grateful and he, he, he acknowledged his gratitude and everything. So he felt very good about it. Well, what a great album it is, though. I mean, I, did you know like it could reach that kind of success? No, um, I did what I've done on many other records since then. I don't want a record record companies that sometimes say, "Well, what are you looking to achieve?" Like, and to me, that's like if I say hundred thousand, they're going to pat themselves on the back at a hundred thousand sales, you know. So I just want them to do the very best they can, and we land where we land if everybody's done the job as well as they possibly can. So. Again, I didn't have a dream. I didn't have a mark, but I just wanted everybody, nobody to slough off or stop pressing the record, but to do the best they could. And so I was happy with the results. You know, they were not expected. Um, you know, maybe it could have been more or less, you know, but uh, we were happy with the results. I was happy with if, the results. If we go back to that guy who was in his little apartment, having just created his own company, and not knowing what he was going to do with Rosebud and, and desperate for money. Can you tell me at what point did you feel like you had turned it around, that there was positive sign that this, this venture of Rosebud Agency was a success? Well, first of all, do you remember that moment? It wasn't a moment, really. It was a period, I guess. But um, before that, I have thought of giving up so many times. I, I had no money. I was getting feeling like I was getting nowhere and, you know, is there a future here? And I had two friends, this same guy, John Paris, that I mentioned earlier from the Ox Band in Milwaukee. He had moved to New York following another friend of ours, Stuffy Schmidt, who's a songwriter in Nashville now. Um, he had moved to New York to try to break the big time, you know, and they went years without being able to really make any significant marks themselves. And I thought, if they can go that long, 
and hang in there with it. Maybe I can too, you know. And I thought about Olympic athletes and how much they had to train and work for years to get somewhere. I thought, hang in, just keep hanging in, you know. And one significant step for me was signing John Hammond. Um, even though Mose Allison and John Lee Hooker might have made more money, somehow there was something about John Hammond. Um, and, uh, you know, a friend of mine had told me he might be unhappy with his current status. And I had John Hyatt opening for him for a week in Vancouver, as a matter of fact, your home, home country. And we went out on the three of us went out in a little rowboat one time. It was like a week-long gig, I remember, hanging out and everything. Uh, and I don't remember the exact details. One detail I do remember, or John remembers, is entirely different than me. He said, he said that I said, do you want to work with an agency that cares about your music? And I don't think I ever would have said anything like that. But he was unhappy, and he wasn't getting as, nearly as much work as he wanted. And... I offered my services, you know, and he, he considered it and he left his agency, which was the Paragon agency in Macon, Georgia, who handled the Allman Brothers, Charlie Daniels, all the Southern Rockers, Elvin Bishop, uh, Marshall Tucker, all these people. But he was, he, he might have been signed there because uh, Dwayne Allman was a big fan of his, you know, I don't know, hmm. but he was not getting full attention. Another big thing of mine about big companies versus small companies. So anyway, he came with me, and I was very proud of that. And and I got his calendar for preceding years, and see, he played here, 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 and lots of spaces between the play dates. And I started calling these places that he played at before, and they're like, "Yeah, well, nobody called us about him. Yeah, we'd love to have him back." You know, it was just some of his problem was just for lack of somebody following up and and keeping him top of mind and caring about him and and trying to make sure that he was getting the work he, he could. So that was a big step. And uh, I, it just, things came together more, I guess. I can't remember what else besides that. Uh, I added various different artists to the point where, at a certain point, I felt like I don't have to sign every name artist in the genre that uh, that I have the opportunity to do so. I can, I can pick and choose. And that was a... a a certain time, you know, special time for me, where I could actually say no. Was it was it difficult for um, your agency that didn't specialize in one genre? Was that an advantage or a disadvantage? Because I presume that if you're only doing blues or if you're only doing jazz, then you're dealing with a certain market and and certain vendors or certain venues. But when when you have like the staple <laughs> singers or or John Hammond, or Robert Cray. I mean, it's we, we have the versatility of the artists, the roster that you had. Was that part of the success of your agency? Um, well, I can touch on one of the things you alluded to there as far as the same realm, which I tried to be very careful about not having. And there was a period where I had too many, I felt maybe too many, white blues rock artists in the same price range. So a festival is maybe going to feel silly, or they've only got so many slots to fill and they've got lots of ideas. Uh, their favorite up and comer, their draws and blah, blah, blah. And, and they wouldn't sign three artists from us that are the same price range, same general thing. So I tried to avoid duplicating or uh, avoid internal competition basically. I think what drew people to us was not the nature of the genres or the genre concentration, but individual artists. I mean, every every agent should accept and recognize that unless they've just developed a, a really great relationship with buyers that don't know what the music is well, and they put it in the hands of the agent. I think it all gets back to the artist, you know, and so Different artists had different followings and, and different areas of the country where they did better. And each time I signed an artist, I might get learn about new accounts that were accustomed to booking this artist, and they could book this artist, the artist that I just signed, and they might fit for these other artists as well. So it all helped. But, but I was very careful not to get too many artists, period, you know, rather than just in a genre. But I'd seen friends, going back to these friends that went to New York, 
and I hooked them up with some significant people. Well, they continued to hook up with significant people, and including a manager who uh, put them with William Morris Agency. And they said to me, thanks, Mike, for all your help all this time, but we're off to compete with Elton John and Led Zeppelin, you know, in the big time. And, you know, that was what a lot of people thought and a lot of people still think. You go with the big agency and you're going to be in the same groove as their top artists. And the reality was they called me about two weeks later saying, could you do anything for us? Any gigs whatsoever. We've got not gotten a single gig from our glorious William Morris agency. And uh, so they came back, you know, and I took them back. But it was a lesson to me when I started Rosebud to keep it small, make sure that every artist got the attention they needed. And a lot of artists see the glitter of uh, the big agency who handles the top artists, but that's their top artists. And they've got hundreds of artists in many cases, maybe a thousand or more artists nowadays below that top echelon that need a gig. I had an, an agent friend who was at an, an agency, was one of the top agencies in the world. And we were friends from before he was an agent. And we had this conversation. He was a responsible agent personally for about 40 artists. Our whole agency with four agents plus myself had about 33 at, at most grand total. And he said, I know you can do better with a lot of the artists I represent, you know, but it's the way it is, you know. At what point did you, did you feel like, I mean, you started off as a regional um, booker and at what point did you feel like you're now a national, you've covered the national territory and at what point did it become international? Um, good points. Uh, as far as national, uh, there was a magazine, performance magazine at the time. You know, I mentioned uh, here I am in San Francisco with a new agency and I've never booked a gig west of Col or Colorado or something. You know? And, uh, you know, I got to know the local scene a little bit, but performance magazine would list the artist names, anything you sent them saying, Jerry Jeff Walker and here's his itinerary. You know, I could see the names of the clubs he's playing in which cities. I call uh, information for that city and get you get the club's phone number and try to start a relationship, you know. And we you could tell by the type of artists or which artists' calendars what was likely to match up well with which of our artists. So it was necessary for the artists I was representing, a Mose Allison who'd been everywhere, Johnny Hooker who'd been everywhere, John Hammond who'd been everywhere. It was necessary for me to be, have national reach. And, inter and international reach. Canada was kind of an automatic right away where our artists tended to do a little better and Europe where the artists tended to do a lot better. And I've just been archiving over a quarter million items and going through all these old uh, correspondences and realizing that in the beginning I would find somebody or come across somebody or they'd come across me in Switzerland or Germany or France or whatever with an interest in John Lee Hooker or something. And we might do a two week tour with that individual coordinating it. Maybe it's an agent, maybe it's a promoter who's doing this with other American artists. And then at a certain point, some of them weren't doing a great job and we took over. And for a while I worked with an agency in London, which was a very significant agency, but I found some of that same problem of uh, not paying attention to all the details of everybody. John Lee Hooker, for instance, uh, I had with, I was doing, working with them for Europe and there was a hole in the tour. And this is after John Lee had taken off significantly. And I knew that in that hole, there was a festival going on in Switzerland that could be perfect for him. And they, I let them know about it. Hey, what about this? They hadn't contacted it. We ended up with a $60,000 date there or something that night, you know, which, at which point I thought, I, and, they, and simultaneous with this, they were only doing our bigger artists. They, I was still booking Europe for our smaller artists. So I was in touch with a lot of the same people. So I took on booking directly in Europe as well. Uh, later on, I, I, how did they start? I, I booked George Thorogood in Japan and my first Japanese booking. And I think it might've been the promoter's first international booking as well, if not one of his earliest bookings period. And, uh, we established a relationship which exists to the day. And uh, he ended up becoming Smash, who now promote the Fuji Rock Festival every year. Oh. This is about the 25th year now, I think, or 26th. 
And I started off, they'd ask me questions about how do we reach this person, that person. By this point, there was a directory. And I could direct them to the different agencies. But some of the smaller artists still didn't have, the, and blues artists didn't have a, a, a solid exclusive agency. So I, I coordinated a number of things for them. Al Cooper over there, um, Eddie Cleanhead Vincent, and uh, some another artist on about the same level for a package tour for them. One situation where I didn't even represent the artist, but and they'd already booked the the tour, but they needed an American agent to contract it, you know. So they gave me a little for that. But I realized things I'd forgotten about Roy Buchanan and all sorts of other people that I booked over there. So international, yes, and then Australia, and I again going through my archives recently, it was more than I remembered of all these. A lot of tours to Australia and New Zealand, a lot of tours to Japan. And more than anywhere, Europe and Europe, the artist said, like going way back, much more appeal for those artists in Europe than in America. I'm curious as to, I mean, you, you're involved in management, you're involved in booking, you're involved in record producing. I guess for you, that's all part of the, the thing. Like it, you didn't decipher one or the other, but was there a favorite thing that you did? Well, first of all, I can mention that I never asked to manage anybody. Every single case of me managing somebody was them asking me to manage them, which I was very proud of. And every single one grew out of an existing relationship as their agent. And uh, so we'd work together. They had trust. Trust is a huge factor throughout the music industry. I enjoyed management more because it was had more room for creativity. You could, you know, I named some of the things, but, you know, getting a sponsor for your tour, getting, doing this or that, you know, it was not finishing out the tour like an agent, filling in the holes in a tour and filling up your three weeks or whatever in the best places. But it's unlimited possibilities what an artist can do and what you can do for them. And I enjoyed that. But again, management takes up a lot more time. And I didn't want to go strictly into management because I had to turn down managing Mavis Staples because I didn't have the time and I helped her find management. Um, Alan Toussaint I loved, but uh, I didn't have time and actually his son was doing the management, you know. A various other artists that I would, loved working with, but I didn't have the time to be their manager and I was able to continue to have that relationship as their agent. So that was one of the main reasons. Agency was also more of a security of uh, ongoing income from a, a broader number of artists who these three are not taking any gigs for the foreseeable future, but these six are, you know, so. But management was a favorite, but I couldn't devote myself entirely to that or I'd cut myself short of those other relationships. So the other thing that you were involved in, in I think the early 2000s, and it probably came earlier than that, was your, your dedication to the environment. And I, I believe your offices were um, powered by solar energy in the early 2000s. Yes, the year 2000. Um, yeah. What drove that? Where does that environmental side of you come from? Well, growing up, I mentioned Rosebud, um, coming from this, thinking back to my childhood and being on a lake in the summertime and hiking around or fishing or swimming or whatever. And I just had an appreciation for it. I wasn't a saint. There was a time later on when I, I had some, I violated the environmental principle somewhat, but I won't go into it. It's really shameful. But uh, there was also a point at which I, this kind of ties in. I had several artists doing really well and I was making very good money. And I felt like this is not satisfying to me. I'm making rich people richer, you know, and that's, that's not satisfying to me. So I wanted to do something better, you know, and I I had the leaning toward the environmentalism. During this period, I'd gotten a call from Michael Martin, who was representing at the time Concerts for the Environment, which he ran. And he asked me about Robert Cray for one of his upcoming events. And we talked some more. Robert Cray ended up, I think, doing it if he was available. But uh, more importantly, uh, established a relationship with Michael and he ended up uh, inviting me to join the board of Concerts for the Environment. And later on, he introduced me to Social Venture Network, SVN, which is a uh, large group of 
business is wanting to do good while doing well. Ben and Jerry's and various other organizations like that were involved in and that various conferences and the involvement with them was really a life changer for me as well. And I'd gotten a call from Earth Justice. Earth Justice was grew out of Sierra Club Legal Defense Fund and they formed their own thing. It was lawyers standing up for the environment and against corporations that were polluting and causing cancer in different areas or individuals who were in that situation or the government doing things, storing things that are polluting the atmosphere, the water or whatever, you know, and they would take the side of the environment or a a company or a community or an individual. And they were doing a, a record called Fish Tree Water Blues about the fish you know, being decimated, fish populations, because forests were being depleted and erosion was going into the rivers and everything. Fish, tree, water, blues. They approached me about Robert Cray and I had a conversation. I I had, I said, you know, let me know if I can help because that was ringing a bell with me, helping the environment, you know, instead of just making rich people richer. So I ended up finishing that record with them, making contacts, getting Etta James and a bunch of other people on the record and kept Mo, I think, and Mavis Staples and J.J. Kale. And uh, then did another record with them later on where I, I really handled all of that outreach and coordination with Willie Nelson and Bob Dylan, Nora Jones, who was at a peak at the time, and uh, Tina Turner with Robert Cray, Tom Waits with John Hammond, Bonnie Raitt with Maria Maldar, various others. So is it really in Captain Beefheart singing to me over the phone, his last recording, um, where I'd, uh, he called me on my birthday once a few years, a year or so earlier and saying happy birthday to me over the phone. And in putting this record together, I thought, what if we change that to happy earth day to mother earth? And he was game. He was an environmentalist also. So, and he was, bedridden at the time and for the last 20 years of his life basically um and with ms and i got a suction cup microphone hooked it up to my handheld telephone and a mini tape recorder and recorded him saying happy earth day happy earth day mother earth Mother, you know, and, and and the whole thing ends, and it ends with the two of us cracking up, laughing, and uh, I made that the last song in the album. Um, I'd actually gone for the Dalai Lama to open the album. I'd seen him speaking in New York City in Central Park, and talking about we have the technology these days to go to Mars, but I think even the equipment to breathe is so expensive. I think it's better that we take care of this little blue planet we're living on. And I wanted to use that as the intro and be part as the outro to the album. But, And I had negotiations with representatives for Dalai Lama, but I, I wasn't able to seal the deal. <laughs> I, I don't know if, if people talked about it as much back then, but I'm hearing a little more and more these days of artists talking about carbon footprints mm-hmm. and their concerns about touring. Yeah. Um, was that ever an issue? Like, did you ever talk about that with your artists? I talked about some of it with the artists. A lot of what you're hearing lately is, uh, you know, followed my my prime time. But um, I can tell you that and when I talk about environmental sins, my entire career was one in a way, because here I was doing my best to get performance opportunities for artists 250 miles away from the last one and 250 miles away from that one in a bus or a truck or a van or whatever. And the other side of what we were trying to accomplish for them is to sell more of these little plastic discs, you know? So I was very conscious of the fact that I was, I was doing my best, but I was countering some of my own ideals, you know, but and things like making this, uh, making these compilations for environmental organizations, I was also supporting other different organizations in different ways that were doing good things. And I felt like, I mean, the, Earth Justice, the second album, I got a $100,000 advance. I worked for nothing, didn't take any compensation for my expenses. I got the the recordings. I had all the artists contribute their recordings at no cost. They, they continued to have their publishing, but the record royalties all went to 
earth justice, for instance. So I felt like making up for some of my sins, you know. But yeah, environmentally, I was very much into the environment. I did establish our office in 2000 was not only the only solar power booking agency in the world, but it was also at that time, the largest solar installation in San Francisco, which I'm happy to say it was dwarfed, you know, many times over by other installations later, but we were early in 2000 and the next year I solarized my home. As they were putting the solar panels on my office, uh, my brother-in-law and nephew were driving up in the H Honda Insight uh, hybrid that I bought in my hometown near where they lived. And I had them drive it out because I'd already, I had to get home and had already bought my ticket. But uh, they were overcharging in the Bay Area for those things by like $7,500. And I was visiting my home in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, I saw one on a lot and I stopped in and they were selling it for less price. And so I, I bought it and had my um, brother-in-law and, and nephew drive it out and they bonded all the way. It was nice. So, but anyway, a lot of things at once. Of all the things that you've done, is there one that stands out as something that you're very proud of? I mean, and, and the list is like ridiculous what you've accomplished, but is there th something you look back on and think, man, I, I can't believe I did that? I think my proudest individual thing was John Lee Hooker's The Healer, where he had he had given up on recording completely, and then he became an international sensation for the oldest person to be in the top 20 uh, in England and things like that, you know. Um, that was, you know, you can always say this or that, but, you know, he'd had various managers, various record companies, various bands, and I think I made a difference there, you know. Um, and J.J. Kale had also, I, I started working with him as his agent after, well, on the on a tour dates that were following the release of his eighth album, number eight. And uh, he was really disappointed. He turned in another record to Mercury Records and, and what do you think? And they were like, well, it would be nice if there was a single, you know. And he thought, if you don't like it, give it back. He paid $350,000 to get it back. And take if he figured if they don't care that much, he doesn't want them to deal with it. And he was totally soured on the record industry. And I was initially his agent, and then he and his manager separated. And I knew somebody at this point now who would Silverton, ran Silverton Records in England, Andrew Lauder. And I knew his taste, and he had signed John Hyatt. I'd signed John Lee Hooker with him. And I knew that he would love J.J. Kale and let him do whatever he wanted. He talked about John Hyde as somebody who he would sign if he was singing in a shower, you know, <laughs> he would sign him. And I knew that he would go for Kale too. So I, I set up a deal for that. And which is a crazy situation. Kale's previous manager had taken a huge percentage from him. And uh, so I sat down with Kale and we were making the record deal. And I said, well, now I'm not just your agent. We have to deal with my compensation as doing this other work as well. And he said, okay, well, what about 50% to me? And I said, no, that's crazy. I can't take that much. And he said, well, what about 35% then? I said, no, that's crazy also. I can't do it. You know, and we finally agreed on a much lower level, but I was always proud that my first argument with him was, no, I can't take that much money. <laughs> and, uh, Anyway, bringing him back to recording when he had given up on it, I was very proud of that as well. And there's one other thing I should mention, if you don't mind, uh, a turning point, 1983. Um, I was representing Muddy Waters, and I, had, I came in very late in Muddy's career, but I booked him as a promoter, as a talent buyer for festivals. And I was... Uh, in my office and his manager, or no, somebody had called me and said, Paragon Agency just went out of business. And not only did they handle all these Southern rockers, they handled Muddy Waters, as well as John Hammond, who I mentioned before. Hearing Muddy Waters agency was going under, I put the phone down, picked it up again, and immediately dialed Muddy's manager, who I dealt with on all these other things, and said, I understand Paragon is out of business. I would love to represent Muddy, you know. and he said, he's getting $3,500, $5,000 a night. Is that something you could accomplish? 
I said, I'm turning down dates at $25,000 a night for George Thorogood. Yes, I'm familiar with the territory, you know. Um, he said, why don't you write a letter and I'll share it with Muddy. So I wrote this passionate, I think, handwritten letter to Muddy about how much it would mean to me to represent him. And before he made a decision, I know he had a gig with John Hammond. I know John Hammond put in a good word for me and maybe others. Finally, I got a call back saying, Muddy said, let's go with that guy who wrote the letter. Then I've first gig, I was booking shows for Muddy before actually connecting in person after that point right away. And one gig was at Chicago Fest. And I came to the show and, and Muddy was in his dressing room, a trailer. The band was already on stage, which is a barge facing the pier in Lake Michigan. And the band is playing before they brought Muddy out. Johnny Winter was there because Johnny would go wherever he could to sit in with Muddy. And uh, all of a sudden, the crowd is chanting, Muddy, Muddy, you know, 4,000 people. Muddy comes out of the dressing room to go toward the stage, and he's coming toward me. The manager had said, have you said hi to Muddy yet? I said, I didn't want to bother him before the gig. And he said, no, go ahead, you know. So I was walking toward his trailer, and Muddy's walking toward me, and the stage is past me. And I didn't know if Muddy would remember me or not. As he got closer to me, he just opened his arms, a big bear hug, with 4,000 people chanting in the background, muddy, muddy, and me thinking, does he remember me? You know, that was a highlight of my life. Um, wow. A highlight of my life. So if we, if we go back to that guy who didn't have a dream, <laughs> who didn't have any kind of a dream, when did, when did you become a dreamer? And when did you become, when did you set goals to achieve all the things that you've done? I never really became a dreamer. Um, I don't think I'd, I would have opportunities and I would want to do the best I could with them. I didn't want to let the artist down. I wanted, I couldn't go to sleep at night if I laid down and I knew there was something else that could be done, you know, to help them out. But I want to mention one other thing. And Muddy passed away. I spent a couple of wonderful times with him while he was sick with lung cancer. I was with him in the hospital where he was telling about the back and forth with Muddy or with John Lee Hooker about who had a car, who had a phone in their car, who had a Cadillac, who had a swimming pool and him imitating John Lee, B -b 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 Muddy, I got a swimming pool too, you know, and, and, uh, and Muddy laughing and joking with me in the hospital, just the two of us. And then my last time with Muddy was at his house. He had had an operation. They thought he was going to be okay. And then it came back and he, they said, we can operate again if he builds his strength and he just didn't have it in him to fight. And so we watched a movie together in his living room with him in his pajamas. It happened to be Neighbors starring John Belushi and Dan Aykroyd, the Blues Brothers. Um, but uh, at any rate, Muddy passed away and I was pretty shocked, uh, saddened. I actually, I'm sorry this is so long, but I was on the East Coast and wanting to, some of my artists were feeling neglected, I think, because George Thurgood was happening to such a degree. And, and uh, so I was visiting some of the artists and I was going to, I was in New York and then I was going to New Haven, Connecticut to see NRBQ. So I was in a hotel. It's a Saturday. Uh, no cell phones at the time. I'm not listening to the radio or anything. I take a train up to New Haven and the opening act in our BQ said they would dedicate the song to Muddy Waters who passed away that day. And that was how I learned about him passing. Um, so it's 1983 and I went to Hong Kong and China on a trip and everything and in Japan. And I was just thinking, what do I do now? You know, um, not that I can fall apart because of Muddy, but I thought I've got a circuit that works for a lot of people. I should incorporate some new people that can use our help. Maybe a, an elderly blues artist who could use our help and an up and comer. And I signed Willie Dixon and Robert Cray. Robert Cray who couldn't get $350 a night except in about four different cities, you know. Um, and Willie Dixon who was the king of songwriters but not that much of a touring artist. So I signed them and then all of a sudden J.J. Kiel's manager contacts me and asks if I want to book J.J. Kiel and Los Lobos. I get recommended to you and by T-Bone Burnett, among a few others. T-Bone was actually leaving the agency and said, yeah, but it's okay. I've got this band for you. They're kind of like a Mexican blues band. And I thought, 
I've been booking Muddy Waters, John Hammond, John Lee Hooker. Just don't I need a Mexican blues band? Thanks a lot. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but then when I saw them, I was a, it was tremendously appealing, you know, and I signed them right away. Not for their blues, but yeah. Right. Anyway, so that 1983 was a really big turning point for me. My final question, and, and it's quite apparent from the interview you just gave that there's a certain integrity that you have. Um, when I met you in New York, and, and the first thing you said to me was, let me know if I can do anything for you, which speaks volumes to, I, I think, the, the type of person you are. Where does that come from? Well, I guess the comment to you is because I, by that point, I knew that I could help people some. And, and I, you know, it's really satisfying. I, I talked to a friend of mine who was in one of the bands that I mentioned from Milwaukee the other day, and he, he runs a farm now where he brings out disabled people and people from the inner city and everything else to enjoy a day or whatever out to, on, you know, canoeing in the boat or swimming or whatever, and having these wonderful opportunities in the great outdoors that they don't get or they're looked down upon and they're treated so well. And he said, I get more out of it than anybody else. And there is that to giving in some way. And I also had, you know, I had connections more than a lot of the artists we represented, we didn't manage and there was no manager for. It. And you can't sit there. They have a need and you have the ability to help them with their need. What kind of an asshole wouldn't do it, you know? Um, you know, especially these are people you care about. So, yeah, if you can help, help. And I think, yeah, family helped. My mother wanted to help everybody every day, ideally somebody every day, ideally before noon. We had five kids in our family. My mother had nine additional miscarriages. Um, wow. And we took in 16 foster children at different times from the hospital until they were adopted and mainly one at a time, but then on occasion two at a time. So that was our, our nature, I guess, you know? And, and the basis of our religion, the basis of most religions, which is ignored by most of them. And I became unreligious at the age of 19 in spite of a sister who became a nun and so on and so forth. But, but uh, the basic thing is, is, to me, is tolerance. Don't hurt anybody, help them if you can. I think those are basic tenets of most religions, you know, followed or not. But not that I'm, a, I'm not religious at all. But, you know, helps people if you can. So, yeah. Well, thank you very much. It, it's been a, an honor to That's sit and talk to you. I really appreciate this. Well, appreciate you, you've led a fantastic life and you've done so much in, in the world of music. And thank you very much for sharing that with me. Well, thanks so much for acknowledging and, and the the kind words, and for doing this in the first place for Karen. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you.